Good evening. I'm going to call this uh, meeting of the Lawrence Alliance for Education to order, and we will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, before we uh, move to public comment, I just want to uh, recognize that we have some uh, elected officials present. Um, we have uh, school committee member Marianella Rivera, uh, member elect Josh Alba, member elect Jonathan Guzman. Uh, we have uh, School Committee member from Greater Lawrence Technical, Stephanie Infante. If you want to stand so you could be recognized, that would be great. I also want to recognize Kim Barry, President of the Lawrence Teachers Union. Thank her for uh, being here, as well as um, her Vice President, Lori Burnham, and uh, Executive Committee members. Kathy Delaney, Trish Woolley, and Mindy Richardson. We uh, thank them for being here tonight. Uh, we'll open with public comment. I will remind uh, folks making public comment uh, that it is uh, two minutes. Uh, and at this time, I will call Mr. Molly. Moyun Mali, 53 Chester Street. In this great happy Thanksgiving season, we are grateful for blessing our best public edu education. Our children going to school every day, grateful for being the participating in the best educational process. We, the parent and citizen, are united to wish the best Thanksgiving holiday for our great leadership. Happy Thanksgiving to leadership of Honorable Superintendent Cynthia Paris, that manage our public school during the worst crisis of Columbia gas in our city. We are thankful to our wonderful teachers and their great union. Lawrence, this city of immigrants with the best education, our children rising up. Again, as the great President Kennedy said, Thanksgiving is the best time that we show our gratitude for God for the blessing our nation has. We are thankful for Honorable Superintendent Leadership, leading Lawrence Public School, keeping our public school open during the worst crisis of our city. We demand Mara Haley as a worst Massachusetts Attorney General to resign immediately since she has done nothing for the victim of Columbia Gas. We are grateful for progress of our public school. This is the best time and the season for best Thanksgiving wishes for our citizens, children, and teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Marianella Rivera. Good evening, everyone. Over the last four years, I spent my time on the school committee working closely with students, parents, and teachers in order to understand the problems in our school system and research ways to fix them. The more time I spent with our youth, their families, and educators, the more insight I gained not only to the issues within our school system, but the adverse effects the state takeover has had on our community. Students are punished for wearing hoodies and forced to freeze because their coat or sweater doesn't match their uniform. Bathroom usage is severely restricted. And some of our students are scared to go to school due to bullying and gang violence. Teachers are working in a climate of fear and are scared to speak out against the injustices for fear of retaliation. Parents are frustrated because their voices aren't being heard. And the biggest impact this receivership has had is that it's disenfranchised our community. We're able to elect people on the school committee, but yet school committee members have no power to address our community's concerns. I've tried to add their concerns to our agenda, but requests were denied by the receiver or meetings were canceled by the mayor. I also propose that the LAE and the school committee host joint meetings every month so that we can work and collaborate together to improve our school system, but that proposal was also denied. It's these types of political games and selfish agendas that are hurting our youth. 
These issues came to light at the safety forum, which none of the LAE members attended for the record. Students and parents voiced their concerns, but they were met with condescending responses. The youth and parents I've interviewed are adamant that the school department lied to the community that night. We're tired of the lies. I don't trust this failed experiment on our children anymore. It's time to transition back to local control. Jonathan Guzman. I want to thank everybody. I want to thank everybody for being here today and taking the time to actually come out and speak up what is going on in our public school system and making sure that um, this community in front of us knows what it is that we need to do in order to move forward for the safety of our environment, our school system. One of the things when I went to the meeting the other day, um, it was that we went for answers. We went to hear somebody speak up and basically tell us what is actually happening in our school system. And sadly, we came out of that meeting without not even a simple answer to our questions. That definitely we want to prioritize. We want to make sure that our next generation is protected. We want to protect them externally and internally, and we want to make that a priority. We, we must improve the approach toward emotional and health, um, mental health in our school system. We need, our partnership has been broken. Students, teachers, parents, administration, and the community have, has lost hope in our school system. And it's really sad because when I was there, I, it was not the best, but we, we were actually something. Our community was bound and we didn't see the destruction that is happening now. And it's definitely, you know, we need to institute some safe learning environment for our children. We, we don't want them to go into school scared. As I walk into the bathroom here <laughs> on the wall, is, there's a, a gang sign, right painted in that boy's bathroom. Didn't need that. It says that right there. It, it's just like, do you the, does the administration team see that? Do they know what that means? The symbols. What are we covering that? What are we doing to you know minimize this control that has a, this group that has terrorized our students? Are bully students are being bullied? There's many parents here that I see crying because they don't know what to do to stop this bullying happening in the school system. 10 seconds. It's definitely something that we need to pr approach. Our parents have, uh, they feel broken. They don't have that partnership with the school. They cannot come in Time. to your school and ask for advice, ask what they need to do in order to move forward with the, stu the student in the school system. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Michelle Lahara. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Michelle Ahara, and this conversation for me hits a little different because I was actually the student representative on the school committee when the vote went through for the receivership, and I was also a student at the Lawrence High School. So I got to see the Lawrence High School prior to the receivership. I got to see the changes that were placed afterwards. And as somebody that was on the school committee as a student, I didn't have a vote, but my opinion was heard. And I was naively optimistic about what this receivership would do for our schools. I then graduated and my siblings went through the Lawrence High School system post receivership. And they did not have the same experiences in high school that I did. So on paper, a receivership sounds good. But what I've seen is that I haven't seen improvement. I haven't seen anything that has worked regarding this receivership. So I'm confused as to why it's still going on, why there hasn't been a transition plan or what that transition plan would look like or if anybody's even interested in transitioning back to that. I had actually pulled papers to run for school committee in, I live in Mount Vernon, so um, I actually decided not to run just because I feel like I can do more as a citizen than on our school committee because they can't vote, nothing gets put on the agenda. So what's the point, really? And that just shows the disenfranchisement 
that's happening to our community. And I am concerned just because the there was a gun threat at the school and I'm not even sure what to believe when it comes to that. The story is unclear. Um, I'm concerned at the things that I've seen. I do work for the city as a social worker and the things I hear, the things I see and what I see our students going through aren't things that weren't already happening. They're just happening at larger rates and it's alarming. So I hope that our elected officials Ten and seconds. I hope that the administration pays attention to that and starts caring about the parents and caring about the students because this is who's going to be a part of our city and if we want our city to move forward, we need to start with these kids. Thank you. Sandy Almonte. Good evening and thank you um, for listening to us tonight. I want to thank the parents that are all here. I want to thank the students because it is their voice that needs to be heard. And by their faces here tonight and having their parents bring them here means a lot. It means that they need to be listened to. <clears throat> And it means that um, we as parents are not going to let our children down and that we're going to come in and we're going to express what our concerns are. My concern personally being that my son uh, fought himself out of uh, the Lawrence High School bathroom back in April and I had to take him to the Holy Family Hospital to have his right hand uh, seen by an orthopedic surgeon for which he had a cast on for a whole month. He had to fight himself out of a bathroom for four students that wanted him to become part of the gang and they said to him, well, if you can fight your way out of the bathroom, then you're free to go. But if we, be, we, we get to uh, beat you, other words we used, then you're ours. This is happening within the Lawrence public school system. We, need, we seriously need to transition because this, this, this is not working. We need to transition into getting our school department back. I want to know what plan you guys have moving forward to take care of the situations that are happening. See, a school uniform is, is not what's happening. That, my son is not getting beat over a school uniform. My son is getting beat over the gangs that you are not doing anything about. And I kind of think that right now it's a little disrespectful that I'm here speaking and Mayor Dan Rivera is looking down at his laptop like, the, like it, it doesn't even matter that we're here speaking because I think that if we're here speaking, your eyes should be looking at the people and especially the, the person who's at the microphone and speaking to you because I think that that's very disrespectful that you do that. It shows how much respect you have for us and as our mayor and our leader, you're showing no type of leadership at this moment. Yeah, make, make that face. You're really good at it too. Yeah, and your smile. Perfect. Well, I just, I really don't have much else to say because obviously you, you guys can see the type, of, um, the, the type of representation that we have. We need to ask for Ms. Paris to step down as our superintendent, and we need to take back our school system. Thank you for coming here today to fight for our kids. This is Time. what needs to happen. They need to step down. We need to take our school system back. This needs to stop. So Tom Myers. Tom Myers, and I reside at 550 Haverhill Street. And I'm going to sort of continue, I think, on the same refrain that um, my fellow citizens who spoke uh, had just addressed. And what I'd like to do is to utilize my time to voice a few concerns, uh, which the data from the Department of Education's website will help to illuminate. And first, what I'd like to address is that Lawrence Public Schools teachers' annual turnover rate, that means teachers leaving the district, is over double the state average. 12% statewide, 26% for the 2018-2019 school year. And it's been that way for the last few years that I've been engaged in uh, you know, following the district closely since I retired as a teacher myself. Um, when you compare this to similar gateway cities, which I think is obviously important to do and to be fair, Lowell has an annual turnover rate, again from the Department of Ed website, of 8% annually, Lynn 
annually, Haverhill 12% annually. The uh, three that I just mentioned, as you well know, are not under state-controlled receivership. Um, Jack Snyder, who I think most of you up here are well aware of, is a professor of, of education at UMass Lowell. His research claims that teacher-faculty retention is the most important indicator of success within a district when socioeconomic variables are eliminated. That's a, that's a compelling statement. In real terms, a high educator turnover often creates instability in relationships between teachers, students, parents, and the community. Ten seconds. Okay, just give me a chance. Kids need to trust their adult mentors, teachers, guidance counselors, adjustment counselors. This cannot occur with an unusually high turnover rate of teachers. What we need to do, guys, is what has already been stated. You can see here Time. the community is interested in their school district. They want to take control of their own school district. Time. You need to work on developing a transition plan. I presented one to most of you. Tom, time. I asked it that you engage in starting to look at a transition plan. Thank you. Stephanie Cazada. Hello, my name is Stephanie Casada. Um, I'm born and raised in Lawrence. I created a program called Young Sisters United, targeting at-risk females ages 16 to 24 in the community. Our goal is to collaborate with the school system and other resources in the community to help provide life enrichment services to our young women, help them become independent, and empower them. Um, I'm here to speak on behalf of I being a resident growing up in the Lawrence Public Schools and the future kids. We need to stop covering problems and find permanent solutions to them. I think that we need to work together as a community and stop pointing fingers and just find the way that we can collaborate and put our differences aside. I think that safety is priority and we have no safety in our school systems in Lawrence in general. Um, not only are the parents affected, but so are the kids, but we also need to protect our teachers as well. We have teachers that are not part of our nationality, and they don't understand our culture, so we also need to help protect them. And I'm here to just um, state this and stand up for our community, and I think that I'm not going to sit here and point any fingers, but we can do a better job, and it begins with you guys, because you guys have the authority to do and make the decisions for us, so please come together with us and meet us halfway, and together we can move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Debo Brown. All right, uh, it's kind of coincidental that Class 89 over there, Lawrence Lancer, has a phone call as I come up, but we'll deal with him later. Um, for you, um, Superintendent, uh, the, the fact of the matter is, the first time you met me, you told me that the school district does everything that they're supposed to do by the book, code of discipline, blah, blah, blah. You even t I was CC'd in the email um, that you had sent me the copy of. But we all know that's not true. Like. I mean, you guys can lie to yourselves if you want, but I think you hear this room loud and clear. I think you hear your students loud and clear. They're tired. They don't want any of this to continue. Me being the class of 99, Lawrence Lancer for life, these are not the same halls that I walk, that these kids are walking. Well, again, in 1999, when we took a leak in the bathroom, we didn't walk into gang signs. We knew they were out there, but it wasn't as prevalent in the schools. Whether you guys want to admit it or not, you're failing our community. I don't know what we're paying you for. I don't know what you're being elected for. But you guys are taking the power away from our school committee to effectively educate our kids. You and your continuous gag orders are useless because the same teachers you tell to shut up 
call me. And I call them. Because at the end of the day, we are a community. We're going to work together to fix our schools, whether you want it or not. Because we are Lawrence, not you. You're not from here. We live here. So we're going to take our schools back. Stephanie said it very well. She's willing to meet you halfway. I'm not. I want what we want. And that's our kids to be put first again in the city of Lawrence. I understand I'm about to run out of time. Ten but Dan, thank you for returning. Dan, you was class of 89. Can look at your screen and even Google that these aren't the same halls that you walk, sir. You as a Laurentian, Time. you as a father raising your kids in the city of Lawrence have the same duty, if not a greater duty, to make sure that every single kid behind you has the same chance that you did. Thank you. I'm... Uh, we've allowed everybody the opportunity to testify who wanted to testify. I would ask you to uh, give us uh, the ability to have our meeting. Um, and uh, people are always welcome to testify at these meetings, and we always do it as the first order of business. Uh, at this time, I'll turn over the superintendent for the student support services update. Absolutely. So we're going to get teed up with the Student Support Services with Assistant Superintendent Mary Toomey. But before I do that, I want to highlight a wonderful ceremony that we had prior to this meeting. So we're proud to say that we have 150 families in over four of our schools, the Tarbucks, OPS, Weatherby Middle School, and Partham Elementary, celebrating one of our initiatives to engage our families and empower them and give them the tools they need to advocate for their students. That's our ELFIS program. It's the Lawrence Family Institute for Student Success. And tonight, we had 49 families from Partham Elementary giving their testimony, having a wonderful celebration, and for, to them, we congratulate them. So next we have an update from Student Services. Mary Toomey will give us an update. We last met with her back in the spring and she's ready to give us an update. Good evening everyone. It's a pleasure to be here again. As you know, we have launched our new Office of Student Support Services and I am back to give you a progress update of how our work is going so far this year. Okay, David, thank you. You will remember that uh, we talked about in the spring that the new Office of Student Support would provide a continuum of specialized services to ensure that all of our students received advocacy, high expectations, and student-centered instruction to meet all of their needs. And I shared with you at that time um, a, just a staircase that we were hoping that we would be able to utilize as um, a piece of all of the services that we wanted to include, starting with ensuring that our schools had a robust response to intervention and instruction program going on, as well as uh, student health and wellness programs. Also, our school counseling programs were effective. We want to make sure that we're addressing all of the needs around social emotional learning and also our special education department. So this was the slide that I shared with you back in the spring and we took this on as our mission to launch and get started uh, in a new way. One of the pieces that we did was to divide the district into four quadrants or zones and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that as we move forward. The next piece I want to share with you is about our student health and wellness and what we've done uh, as we promised to do. We hired a uh, master RN, a lead master nurse, who coordinates everything that happens in the district on a daily basis. Nancy Walsh starts her day at 5.30 and she ensures that all of our schools have coverage um, in case there are any absences or needs so that we have services available for all of the children. She also recruits and helps me assign highly qualified new hires as needed, so Nancy and I did a little bit of that work this summer. And um, she provides meaningful professional development to folks um, around the district. She deploys herself to schools for targeted support as needed, 
and is very, very effective at that. And she also does all of our ordering of supplies. She um, maintains and facilitates um, the supervision of all of our nurses and staff and was able to help us secure 10 lightweight evacuation chairs and mats to support wheelchair-bound students who may need um, evacuation. She was also able to secure um, and receive a donation of EpiPens at no cost for all of our schools. So Nancy is just um, a great addition to the staff. She's a longtime nurse um, in Lawrence, and we were very proud to elevate her to this opportunity. Can you, can you go back a second? Sure. Mr. Chair, through you, what's the, what's the, the, the count on RNs and LPNs in the school system? I believe that the count is um, about 30 RNs and 17 LPNs. Um, so that's, is that 47 nurses? Correct. District-wide? District-wide. Great. So next, um, I want to share with you a little bit about our school counseling and guidance program. We talked about last spring that we were going to also hire a lead school counselor who would help all of our counselors with everything that they needed, and we did, in fact, do that. Um, we were very fortunate, and Brittany Lynch joined us as the lead district-wide counselor. Brittany is doing a fabulous job. She supports professional development. She deploys herself to schools in need of short-term targeted support where needed. She helps the teams determine functions of behavior. She assists with the development of intervention plans, and she helps the response to intervention and instruction process go smoothly in each of the schools. She is um, also uh, managing the RTI process, is a resource to school teams, and she's just supporting the district focus on restorative justice practice, which is a new initiative for us this year. She has helped us to facilitate level one restorative justice professional learning, and we're doing that through the Center for Restorative Justice at Suffolk University. Nine of our schools are involved, and all of our counselors have completed the two-day level one training. Also, our counselors are now taking a mini course with the Ely Center, and that course is talking to them about social-emotional learning practices and tools that will help assist our kids in the classroom. So that's going really nicely, and we're really happy about that as well. Mrs. Toomey, may I interrupt? Could you tell me how many councils are in the district? Uh, the councils in the district are about 66. And do you know how many are at the high school? I don't have that off the top of my head, but I can get that for you easily. Pat, I, uh, there's 15. There's 15 guidance. I'm oh, sorry, guidance. Superintendent? 15. 15? Yeah. OK. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, moving on to social emotional learning, um, we talked about this last spring as well, and I wanted to provide you with an update about how we're doing with that as we move forward. Uh, we have set the expectation that school le leaders consider increased supports to help all students improve self-regulation. We have decreased a reliance on punitive measures in favor of cultivating restorative classroom communities. We've supplied supports to schools, including zones of regulation and caring school community curriculums. We have... Um, Mary, Mary, can I just interrupt you for a sec? Just to follow up on Pat's question, and perhaps, Superintendent, you can answer this. <clears throat> if there's 15 counselors at the high school, what is the ratio of counselors to students? We're happy to address that a little bit later, if that's okay, just with the presentation it's on the, the high school. Yeah, we okay. can talk about that. All right. Yeah, for Thank sure. you. And just to note on the counselors at the high school, it, some of those counselors are school adjustment counselors, as in the K-8 to schools, and some of them are guidance counselors helping with college admission. So there's two roles that go on there at the high school level. Uh, so just to finish up here, um, I just want to make sure I don't miss anything. Um, we also provided all of our leaders with coaching and um, expertise and training around social emotional learning. That's happened as well. So our special education redesign, as I told you at the top of this presentation, was really the big effort that we pushed <laughs> over the summer. We came up with a 
system by which I think is working really nicely. With some reallocation of staffing and resources, we were able to divide the district into four quadrants or zones. And within those um, zones, we have about eight or nine schools. And what we've tried to build uh, is a team of learning professionals, related service providers, and team coordinators um, who are all under the direction of a special education zone director. We have four of them. So I want to just um, let you know who they are and give you a little more information. In zone one, we have Marlena Yazalgas, who is a former um, ETF who working in our district and is now elevated to zone director for zone one. And you can see the schools there that she is working with, closely with. In zone two is Sean Reardon. And Sean, um, Mr. Reardon worked with us for many, many years and um, was able to come back to us. He was a principal um, in another community for a little while and we were able to coax him back in and he's very excited to be back with us again. And in zone three, Carol Keenan uh, is doing a great job with zone three and the schools in that zone. Um, she's also supporting the early intervention screening team, which is a very important group of people that work daily in an arena format in order to evaluate and screen children as young as two years, nine months. Um, they're referred to us by early intervention, by their families, by the doctors, and uh, we want to be sure that we are starting to provide services as early as possible to those kids. So that uh, site-based arena team is working out really nicely for us. And then in Zone 4, which includes the high school campus and all of the programs associated with um, grades 9 through 12, we have James Parker. James was an assistant director with us last year, and he was elevated to the position of director this year. So these folks are able to support schools more regularly. They're out in the schools attending IEP meetings. They support principals. They're supporting teachers. They're providing professional development. And they work very closely with the related service providers, speech, OT, PT, and everybody else that is part of the evaluation team doing outreach and support with families and parents. And um, we're really pleased that that's going on. John, um, could I ask sure. one, one other question? Within these zones, have you assigned specific um, special service providers, the OT, the PT, the Correct. speech? Correct. But, so each zone has people identified? A continuum of service in each zone. Okay. The idea there is that as the child moves from pre-K through their elementary school, through their middle school, they're going to have the same set of service providers and they, these folks can talk to one another, they're meeting with each other, rather than having all of the speech folks meet once a month for this meeting and then all the OTs meet over there. They're meeting as an arena team. They're meeting as case providers that are working with each other to meet the needs of all of the students. And as a follow-up, um, do we have any openings in speech as far as speech um, teachers? Not at the moment. We had two um, recent openings, and they've both been filled. All right, so no student is receiving compensatory services at this time. I can't say that. There was some owed from summer school that we're still making up because for some reason the student wasn't able to get all of the hours. So we're still applying some compensatory, but it's all being done. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So moving on, um, one of the things that was very exciting this summer is that we had a very successful um, extended school year ESY program for summer school and we added a learning showcase and our families were invited to come and see. You can see a photo of the superintendent there attending and a few of our kids and what they got to experience um, all during the summer weeks as well as in the learning showcase. I just included my little photo of me with Maya. Maya was a student at South Orange East while I was there and still remembers me and it's always a pleasure when I get to see her. So really was a great summer program. We've already got begun planning for um, the next school year, uh, 2020 for the summer, and getting things underway. So we're really excited about that and we'll have more to share with you about that as we go. I wanted to give you a little snapshot of the data about where we are when we think about who are our kids that have um, special needs. And so this shows you by their primary disability, um, understanding that some kids do have a secondary or even a tertiary 
disability, but this gives you a snapshot of where they are, and we're pretty much in line with other communities in the state. Um, our largest group of kids are identified with a specific learning disability, and you can see those numbers there in terms of what that looks like. Um, our total enrollment versus where we are currently with special education places us at about 18.2% of our kiddos. Um, and if we look at where we were for all of 18-19, we ended the year at 19.2, and Massachusetts average for 18-19 all of the year was 18.1. We'll probably be right in that same vicinity. Some of our students, of course, have graduated and moved on, and we have new referrals coming up. So we're right in about the same place with that, uh, that data. Um, at some point in the future, I'll come back and share some inclusion data with you and some other things that we're very proud of. Um, the next Mary, slide. What, I, what's the range uh, relative to specific learning disability? What, what, what are the range of challenges students are facing within that category that has the largest number of students? Yeah, it could be anything. It could just be a reading deficit. It might be having to do with writing or math. Um, it might be executive function. There's all different um, pieces, and so that's why it's an individual education plan. The, uh, the team will decide exactly what the goals are that um, will contribute to that student making progress. So, and everyone on this uh, snapshot is on an IEP? Everyone on that, yes, has an IEP, correct. And how many on the autism spectrum uh, would be uh, in um, uh, one of our, uh, what we were formerly calling the, the ASD classrooms. Yep, um, in the ILP classrooms. We, um, we have that data for you and can share that with you. We currently have 12 of those classrooms in the district that are serving kids on various parts of the spectrum and they're included for various amounts of time during the day. But many of our kids who also um, have an identified needs of autism, you know, are not part of the um, ILP classroom. Yep. They're included in general education for all of the day, full inclusion. And kids under, um, who fall under the 790 who fall under a specific learning disability, um, would those kids also um, uh, fall under another category on this list? This is their primary disability. Right. That's what we're showing you here. They could have a secondary or even a tertiary disability. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. John, can I Please. ask? Uh, so, Mary, forgive me if I'm jumping ahead again to another part of your report, but can you speak about what is the district-wide plan or structure for involving the parents of special education students? Yeah, I'm in going to get to that. Okay. Absolutely, thank you for reminding me. David, I think I'm stuck, so I just want to make sure that I'm hitting this correctly and that it's not that bottle that's in the way, or you might have to pilot for me there. So um, I also wanted to share with you that we're really proud of the commitment we're making to high quality professional learning this year. Um, one of the big initiatives we're doing is around inclusion in co-teaching. So we have been working with all of our related service providers on how they can engage in more opportunities to co-teach and, and push into classrooms rather than do pull out. We also have a co-teaching pilot happening in four of our schools um, that involves six classrooms. And those folks are really being our pioneers in this co-teaching model and they will help us get ready for next year. We, um, our ETFs are involved in a mini course this year. Uh, Massachusetts is working on the creation of a new um, IEP template and we are helping our ETFs get ahead of that and get ready for some changes that are coming down the line. Um, next we are also uh, having um, someone come in, Mr. Connolly was mentioning our ILP classes, our independent learning programs where we have students who are identified on the spectrum attending and so we have a specialized consultant who is working with each of those teachers for um, coaching that's going on in the classroom 
and that's happening for all 12 of those classrooms as well as um, coaching for the BCBAs, the board certified behavior analysts who work very, very closely with all of our ILP classrooms. So that consultant is working with them. We are also um, providing a drop-in network for special education teachers so that they can um, get together after school once a month and um, have support and share some practice, uh, and they're enjoying that very much as well. And then um, finally, thanks to Superintendent Paris, um, we have researched and looked for um, increases in augmentative and alternative communication known as AAC training for our speech um, and language pathologists um, and our speech and language assistants, but we're also including our board certified behavior analysts and our occupational therapists because again, we, we're trying to have these um, related service providers work um, as a team and we want them to have the latest technology and the latest resources and understand how to use that. So this is just a snapshot snapshot of some of the great professional learning that's going on in our um, office and in our department and across the district. So we're really proud of that as well. So these are courses for those staff members that we have on staff, SLPs, SLAs, BCBAs. And that's correct. People that work for the district. That's correct. Wow. Thanks. Thank you. And we're going to go to the next slide. Thank you very much. One more, David. Um, and so I just want to give you a preview of something that um, the district uh, is very excited about. Um, again, Superintendent Paris is very interested in helping us ensure that we can provide um, a continuum of not only support but of the resources that are going to help our students succeed. And um, learners need all different kinds of instruction and support. And we find that uh, for intensive tier three instruction, for students who may have a language-based learning disability, and Mr. Connolly was just talking about what kinds of students uh, fall under a specific learning disability. It could be a student who has a language-based disability. It could be a student who is diagnosed with dyslexia. And so for those students, they need even more specialized instruction. The Wilson certification is very rigorous. We currently only have one educator in the Lawrence Public Schools who is Wilson certified. And once an educator goes through the rigorous training program and completes the certification, they are certified forever. So um, we are hoping to have up to 30 teachers engaged in this year-long program um, next school year. So you'll be hearing more about that as we move forward. So we were just talking about um, connecting with families and communities. Um, this is a, a little preview slide of that. Obviously, we're, um, let's move ahead, David, thank you. We're very um, connected with our CPAC, our Parent Advisory Council, and just as a shout out, their next meeting is going to take place um, on November 21st at the Lawrence uh, Public Library right across the way here. And we'll tell you a little bit more about some other workshops that are happening for parents. But these are just a few of the groups that we are partnering with out in the community and with families um, so that we can meet the needs of all of our learners. Thanks, David. I think uh, you're, you, I'm not sure if I'm driving or you are. My last slide is about oh. what's next. Well, I, I just Can have a follow-up question there sure. in terms of the parent involvement. Are IEPs translated yes. for families? Okay, and if a parent who does not speak English wants to come in and talk to a teacher or an administrator about it, what is their access to translation? One of the things that I wanted to mention to you at the top of the presentation and I, I forgot to remind you is um, in the spring, if you remember through the budget process, um, we added nine FTEs. Two of those FTEs were to add additional interpreters, okay. um, certified licensed interpreters, Spanish interpreters. So we have four now, one in each zone. And so by appointment, they are available for meetings or, or for folks that are available. In our office centrally, um, we have folks on staff who can interpret. So if any parent comes to the office, they can do that. We also took five uh, clerical positions that were formerly at central office for the last 
I don't know how many years, as part of the, uh, the special learning office, and we deployed them out to the schools. So one is now working out in each zone, is a home based in a school, so it's easier for families than to come always to the central office. Um, the, so there's one in each zone, and then the fifth one is home based with that um, early intervention screening team I told you about because they're doing meetings every single day and they're doing also evaluations with families who come in. And part of that screening is to interview families, so we need to have someone on site there too, so an interpreter and also a, a clerk who is bilingual. So that's happening as well. Okay, so then my next question is, what would you say are some common concerns that parents raise when they're meeting with either individually with you know a, a counselor or an administrator or a teacher or collectively through CPAC like what what is it that parents of special ed students are there any themes that are arising in terms of what some of their concerns are or things that they would like to see addressed or things that they're worried about or so on yeah um, that's a hard one off the top of my head right because we communicate with families and parents every single day and you know, one of the themes that I can share is that you know, we have the same goals. Everyone wants their child to be successful. So that's what we hear all the time. How can you help, help me help my child be successful? And what else can you do to make sure that that happens? So you know, we're spending a lot of time. I'm going to meetings. I'm going to IEP meetings as well. And so we're trying to spend a lot of time um, connecting with families and making sure that we're making the best possible decisions for services, for placements, um, and you know, making sure that we're monitoring that process as well. So um, you know, we've, we took the summer to really take a look at um, you know, where there were some concerns. We did a lot of outreach to families to see, because as you know, families have the option um, under their rights. They have the options of um, ex accepting or rejecting any uh, services or placements. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to ensure that um, we were reaching out to all of those families who may have had a question. And we've had a wonderful success rate of being able to um, meet their needs and uh, get them the services that they want. I would add just that the families that I've met with students with special needs will usually say it's really complicated to understand how to design an IEP. Mm -hmm. And so those are the questions that I get the most, like what's the secret? It's, it's a very complex document. Yeah. And then um, translating it in a very timely, quick manner, that's the other thing that um, we can always do better because we have so much in terms of volume. Yeah. But it's pretty consistent around like, how do I read this, mm -hmm. the, the actual document and the way it's designed. Right. Right. And the, you know, the template is something that comes sort of from the state and it's, I, it's, it's regulated. Mm -hmm. And so we, we try to go step by step and unpacking what each piece of the IP means for their student. Okay. And we ask them at every meeting, um, the ETFs are required to ask them, you know, how they would like their uh, documents, whether they would like them in English only or whether they would like them translated. So every meeting, even if they had said at one time, you know, they wanted them in English and then they can change their mind at another meeting and we change that, that up. Um, oftentimes parents don't want an interpreter at the meeting, they're fine speaking, but they would prefer to get their documents in both languages and so we do that too. It's the parent's choice. Okay, my, my last question, because I'm just curious about this and ignorant about it as well, is do we, how do we measure the success of what we're doing in terms of interventions in special education? Is it the same way that we would measure it for any student in the system in terms of MCAS scores, although we all know how problematic that could be, or in, in across the board? Um, or are there other ways that we're thinking about what it means, like how, how successful are we being in providing the support that these students need to succeed? Sure, I mean assessment is always a part of it, right? And so our, our students receive the same assessments as, um, as any other student does. In addition, um, we are required to provide a progress report, a specific progress report that is based on the goals and objectives of each student's IEP at least as often as the school sends home a report card. So this is a very personalized report that goes home and every service provider responds to that report. 
um, so the parent gets a good uh, amount of information about how the child is doing toward mastery of their specific goals and objectives from their IEP. So that happens if the school is on a trimester system, that happens three times, and for our schools like the high school that are on a quarterly system, that happens four times a year. And is that data too individualized to kind of, like I think it would be good for this board to hear like how we're doing and whether it's, you know special education students are making progress and whether parents feel that they're being supported and is there a way to aggregate that data and kind I'm of sure and let can, us know how we can think about a way is. to do that down the road sure yeah absolutely we can come back later this spring with the subgroups to include special education students and how they measure against students who are not a subgroup so l's are included right. in that data students with ieps are included in that data yeah i and I don't know how the rest of the board feels about this, but I think I would love to hear from, well, both maybe from some of the zone directors and from some parents themselves about, you know, both what they think are the successes of how these things are, these interventions are playing out and what are the kind of continuing challenges or things that we run up against in doing this, because that would be helpful, you know, in, in, for us in, in any decision making around this. Sure. Thank you. I mean, I, I think that um, a way to get to that uh, outside of the, the regimented um, process of the IEP and the, the, the regulations around it, because it is by law, you got to do it. Mm -hmm. It's uh, conscripted or prescripted? Mm -hmm. It's prescriptive. Prescripted. Um, but if you can get um, blind testimonials, just like, you know, and get folks to say these, we, you know, we talk to about four or five parents and say they've told us X, Y, and Z, this is what they feel about. And we can get those um, individually, not in a public meeting, so that's not something that's out in the public. That'd be helpful. Um, and only because I think you're not gonna get to the meat of it unless you see or hear specifically the, out of their own words. Sure. How they're feeling about it. Yeah. Um, and, and the data is so rigid. It is. Um, mm -hmm. I was gonna suggest maybe that we could have the IEPs and the, the, the documents around that be, do it the way the state says to do it and make sure you go through every piece of it, but then maybe do a more easy to read, more user friendly version of it. But I think that if you do that, you might be outside the regulations, mm -hmm. you, you know, and if you miss a thing, you might get in trouble for it. Yeah, um, there certainly is a checklist. Very dry. Um, I went yeah. through, um, had my, my boy get tested um, over at the Weatherby, um, I think it was at the Weatherby. Um, and it was very, like, there was a lot of words. There was not one picture on the document, and she had to go through every step. And um, I felt like I'm getting what she's saying, but there's got to be a way to, way to better way to communicate this to me. But I think it's because it's, it's part of the regulation. And one of the things that, you know, we're doing with our ETFs in that um, mini course I told you about is helping them understand how to make that user friendly. Um, you know, oftentimes, you know, there's a lot of, we can go in there, and so how do we make that user friendly so that we can all um, all feel like we're included and that we understand what's going on? So you're absolutely right about that. You know, we're trying to do better. This slide here is about what's next. So you know, it's still early November, and so we've only been at this for a couple of months with our changes, but we still have some things on the horizon that we wanted to share with you. Um, we are going to uh, revise and revamp the website, what's on the LPS website, so you should see some additional resources coming out in the next couple of weeks on the website to reflect the changes in the department. Um, we are planning a special education advocacy cabinet to take on the work uh, that's gone on in the district for the last couple of years. There's been an inclusion steering committee that's done really good work and has led us to this point where we were ready to launch these changes. And so now we feel like we need the support of schools, um, both principals and teachers and parents, um, some of our, our agency providers and some, um, hopefully, um, one of you to be representing, represent, representative on this board and um, to help us um, just kind of meet probably four times, give us some feedback, and help us tackle some of the big issues 
one of the first things that we want to do and disseminate is to develop a working definition of inclusion and what that means to all of the stakeholders that are part of the group so that when we talk about inclusion, um, we're all talking the same language, right? So that everyone uh, knows, all of our families and all of our stakeholders know what we mean in Lawrence when we say inclusion and what's happening. And then I want to announce, I gave you a flyer that's hot off the press at the back of your packet. We want to announce our very first uh, family workshop series in conjunction with CPAC. We will be doing this December 2nd through the 5th. Um, we'll have one evening in each zone, and parents may choose which evening they'd like to come to. This particular uh, session is going to help introduce uh, the team uh, to the families uh, and also learn some strategies to promote positive behavior and self-regulation. Our BCBAs have graciously volunteered to come and present at these evenings. It's just an opportunity to have a conversation with families, introduce ourselves, and get personal um, with them. So we're hoping to spread the word and have some great attendance at those sessions that will occur um, across the district in just a couple of weeks. And that brings me, I think, to uh, see if there's any other questions that I can answer for you. I think we've asked them along the way. So thank any you very other much. Questions? Mayor. I know we talked a lot about um, a lot of new things, a lot of things that are happening. And I just want to get a gauge. Um, are the new tactics and new practices, are you talking about 10% of the stuff you're doing is new from 2018, from the 20%, um, 50%? Well, this is a new hat for me, as you know, right? I've been on the so curriculum side of things. So it's 100% for you. It's 100% new for me. Um, not really, because all of our work, you know, kind of uh, moves and shakes together. Uh, I think that there's a considerable amount of newness to the work that we're doing. I think we're um, investing in a lot of professional learning for folks that haven't had a chance to do a lot of that in the past. So I think that's new. I think the responsiveness to families and to schools uh, in terms of how we're coordinating our staff so that they can be there and help answer questions, I think that's something that we've increased quite a bit. Um, so, you know, it's work that we're proud of. And we won't be finished even in a year. This, this is going to take some time to keep going, and we're always a work in progress. We can always do better. But if I'm a CPAC parent and I have lived in the system before, this and now, how do they think? Is it is it like ten percent change to them? Are they they're feeling a, a different environment? I think we'd have to ask the parents that question, right? It might it might be too early for them to tell, but I will certainly bring your question to the workshops, to the CPAC membership, and to the workshops in the coming weeks. I think that's a great question for me to ask them as I introduce myself. What do you feel like has changed, and how can we do better for you? I think that's a great question. I thank you for that. From my visits to the schools, I would say that administrators and teachers feel like this is quite significant change in terms of the structures put in place. So this idea that Mary created the zones is quite different than we've experienced before. So it gives the continuity of not the service providers, but the services. So that's very dramatic uh, change in, in terms of what the teachers are experiencing um, and definitely the administrators who get that continuity for their students and families. Thanks. Yeah, I would just say that in future presentations, I know that it's sometimes hard to do this in a meeting that's broadcast on TV and open to the public, but it would be really useful to hear about the challenges and the things that, that we're struggling with in this arena, because for instance, budget discussions will be on us before we know it, and that is gonna help us make decisions about where money should be invested, and there's more money that's quite, you know, probably coming into the school system because of this, and I, we have a need to deploy that wisely where it's most needed in the system, and so understanding where some of those challenges are would of be course. helpful. Thank you. So, Des, you should know that Mary has data ready to go, and I said, let's hold off to budget season so you can come back and share that. So you were thinking the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was my weekend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and superintendents that saved those. Save those. So we're ready. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Pat? Mary, just just a suggestion. I'm I'm listening to Jess and you know, sort of thinking about parents and their reaction to this change. Might you consider um, doing some kind of a survey at the end of the year that might go along with the progress report 
that parents could return to the district as far as how they felt the year went with the different you know, Definitely. quadrants within I was, the city? I was thinking of that as, as the mayor was talking. Um, one of the things that we did with the changeover to the new report cards was that we did an electronic survey, right, that we sent out to parents via email, via their email address, and it's a quick, easy way. Folks can do it on their phone. So I was already starting to think about, you know, maybe we'll do an electronic survey for folks and see if they want to give us, like the mayor said, some testimonials that we can then tally up. So. Good idea. Okay. Thank you. Great. Mary, um, thank you for the uh, presentation. appreciate um, the update. Uh, and um, Jess, I just want to echo your comment. I think we um, should invite uh, CPAC to come in um, as well. Uh, Mary, thanks for all your hard work. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I'll turn it back over to uh, the superintendent um, uh, relative to the uh, safety presentation. Great. Thanks, Mary. So I'll ask um, Captain McNamara, Lieutenant Burke, Assistant Superintendent Marisol Sheets to be teed up for the presentation on safety and then LHS update. I'll give context to this presentation and of course I'll share with you all our um, experience last week. So last Wednesday we hosted a safety forum with the goal of sharing safety structure communication protocol and to provide a space for questions, concerns, and feedback. In attendance, we had Lawrence High School administrators and staff, safety officers, school resource officers, central office leaders, law enforcement, parents, students, elected officials, and self-proclaimed community activists. The three-hour session was highly emotional, it was political, and overall a display of self-serving agendas. There were personal insults laced with profanity to myself and LPS leadership, outburst of anger, demands for extreme punitive measures for kids, questions about LAE attendance and accountability, and resentment, resentments about, leader, um, about receivership. We also had questions about the 927 event. Newly elected school committee members, supported by current school committee members, used the forum as a platform to blame and attack the system with misleading information and encourage, encourage our youth to be disrespectful. I invite them and members of this board to be curious, to offer perspective and feedback, and to join us in being part of the solution as we work to address the challenges our community and school faces. I remain determined to work Collaborate, excuse me, collaboratively, and look forward to working together as we continue to make progress towards our goals. And lastly, I'd like to commend Lawrence High School staff and central office leaders for their professionalism and their leadership. So tonight, we're gonna give you a briefing on that. We're also gonna give you an update on current status of the high school and our next steps. So I'll um, take it over. Thank you, Superintendent Paris. Um, so, given that it's a busy year so far, we felt that this, it would be a good opportunity to share um, how we approach the task of keeping our students and staff safe, and how we communicate with families when there is a safety issue. There seemed to be a lot of questions around that, and we wanted to make sure that folks were clear. Um, at the presentation last week, the question came up, and I was unable to answer, uh, but the question came up as to why a month later for the public forum. Um, the week, so the, the event that happened on 927th, that week upon the return, there was a lot that needed to happen to support students and staff. Um, and that was our priority. By the second week, we decided that we need to hold a community forum. We decided to give a two weeks notice so that way we could have the most turnout for, for families and families not feel that they didn't get enough notice to attend the forum. So at our forum, um, we had uh, an agenda which included welcoming introductions, safety resources and practices, communications, how families can help, and then we opened the door for questions and answers. So, um, Mayor Dan Rivera was not available, but um, recorded a video um, sharing his thoughts and uh, support for an engaging community forum around safety at Lawrence High School. 
President was Cynthia Paris, Superintendent Lawrence Public Schools, myself, Maricel Sheets, Assistant Superintendent, and um, Sean Burke, Lieutenant Sean Burke from the Lawrence Police Department wasn't present, but Captain McNamara was there in his behalf, along with uh, Police Chief Roy Vask. So, um, when thinking about the safety resources at the high school and the practices, there's currently three school resource officers that work for um, the Lawrence P P Police Department, uh, but are stationed at the high school campus. Their role is to keep actually all of Lawrence Public Schools safe. So they not only serve the campus, they serve also all the schools when there is a situation that requires their attention in order to keep our students and staff safe in the buildings. Uh, we do have school safety officers. We have 10 school safety officers on campus with over 400 cameras um, with a single access point through the safety desk. We also have six deans of student and school culture specialists to help students feel empowered, listened to, and comfortable sharing outcomes or concerns with trusted adults um, and that they feel that they can be heard and feel safe. So that is my overview for um, our school resource officers, our school safety officers, and our security resources. I'm gonna hand it over to Lieutenant Burke and Captain McNamara to discuss um, the role of the Lawrence Police Department in partnership with Lawrence Public Schools. Good evening, everyone. Um, just wanna introduce myself for those of you who don't know me. My name is Scott McNamara. I'm a captain with the Lawrence Police Department. I serve in the role of our um, Bureau of Field uh, Services uh, Commander. Um, that consists of all of our uniformed police personnel, our patrol officers, and also our school resource officers. Um, Lieutenant Sean Burke is, is the unit commander of our school resource officer unit, and he's here tonight to talk a little bit about what we do every day to keep your students uh, safe in the school environment. So I'll turn it over to Sean, and, and then from thereafter, we'll, we'll, see, uh, we'll work together to answer any questions you may have. Well, I'd like to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd like to, uh, first of all, thank you for, for having us, and the, uh, the idea of this is to give you a brief overview of exactly what the SRO unit, or the School Resource Officer Unit, does in the Lawrence Public Schools. As it was stated before, um, we do have three SROs, School Resource Officers, who are police officers that work full-time in the schools. Um, so exactly the, the uh, a little bit of an overview. I will not be reading this completely because I made the print way too small for sitting <laughs> way back here, and I'm very old. Um, but a little bit about the overview of the SRO program is that, uh, believe it or not, we are the oldest school resource officer uh, program in the in the area. Uh, we're about. Uh, I'm going to be dating myself because I was the first SRO. Out of my 32 years, about 27 of those years have been working with the school. I've been very lucky through my whole career as even getting promoted, um, I've been very lucky to, to stay involved as being in charge of it. Um, we, have <clears throat> we have great officers. If any of you have dealt with the officers, you know that they have a, a genuine caring uh, for the students of Lawrence. They, they all grew up within the city. Um, and the main goal that we have is, number one, is to keep all of your kids safe uh, within the city of Lawrence, every student in Lawrence Public Schools. We do that in uh, a couple of different ways, um, and we'll get through that to preparing. But as far as keeping kids safe, we, we do extensive training. We are one of the, the better prepared and probably in the forefront within this region um, whether it's active shooter, uh, emergency response, and that, that is all through Chief Vask. Uh, we have done a multi-process multi uh, preparation uh, with multi-jurisdictional. So we have trained with, with Lawrence, Methuen, North Andover, Andover, because as you know, this is, even though Lawrence is a, a very densely populated city, we are a relatively small area, so we'll all be relying on each other to help each other. Uh, so with that, um, we've also trained with the Lawrence Fire Department. 
as far as emergency response and getting them in uh, if there was ever an incident in the school. So you can see that we, we have pretty much worked with all of the stakeholders to prepare in case something happens. On a daily basis, I have to tell you that arrest is usually our last resort. And if you look at the numbers from the arrest of, of the SRO, you'll see that it is definitely our last resort. The whole idea of preventing issues from the school, we take it up as building relationships. I can tell you that um, the SROs have a very strong relationship. There are numerous incidents where that relationship has prevented something from happening, where the students have felt comfortable enough to come up to the officers and say, hey, I heard this, I heard that, this is going to go on, this might happen later. Uh, and with that, those officers have been able to, to look into it and uh, averted um, many incidents that, that could have happened and, and get um, the child some help. The other part that we do is that, again, referring back to building relationships, we go above and beyond just being that, that cop in school. Yeah, we walk the halls, we make relationships with the kids, we try to talk to as many kids as we can. Obviously, we handle any crime or we make, uh, we make preparations in case something does happen. But beyond that, the officers work beyond the school hours. Um, we work four open gyms a week. We work two at the Arlington and two at the SLE. And the, um, the two at the Arlington are grant funded through a grant that we wrote through the Shannon, uh, the state Shannon uh, Youth Violence Grant, and that funds it. Um, a compliment to the mayor because uh, when he recognized how successful that was, he actually came up with city funds to open up South Lawrence East School an additional two days so it wouldn't just be North Lawrence. It would be an open gym in South Lawrence. So four days a week there's an open gym, uh, thankfully that he could find the money. And just to let you know how, how often that is used, we were doing the numbers today and obviously we have reports, but between the, those four days we're looking at 10,000 kids through those doors in one year. Um, and obviously a lot of it is the same kids, but, but we're taking 10,000 kids through that door that would be out on the street for those three or four hours uh, and giving them a constructive, constructive place to play. They all follow the rules. Again, the whole idea is to build relationships, to build citizenship, to make them understand that hopefully they have to give back to our community the way the officers do. Uh, we also run another program called the Junior Police Academy. We do about 50 to 70 kids every summer for two weeks straight, uh, all high school aides who come into our program. Uh, we run the program usually about five o'clock to seven o'clock because as we know during the day, kids have a lot of things to do, whether it be a summer camp or uh, extra schooling during the day. So we run that, so kids give up their own time between five and seven. And again, the whole theme behind that is building relationships with kids. We want, we want the youth of the city of Lawrence to not only be comfortable with the SROs, but to be comfortable with all police officers. We give them an inner look at what it's like to be a police officer, and believe it or not, the hardest point we have to get across is that we have a, this is our job. It's not who we are. It's not our life. Um, you know, I, I remember talking to kids and telling them that I have to go home and feed my dog, and they were in awe that I had a dog. And I'm like, you know, this is just a badge and this is my job. I, I don't do this and this isn't my life. And I think when you get that across to kids that, hey, this is not a faceless, nameless job. We are all people that live in this community that, that want to make it better. I think that really goes, uh, goes far. So you can see that, again, we are not just cops and occupying force in the school system. Um, we are there to help as much as we can. Obviously, we... We need to take police actions at some times, but again, the number one driver is relationships both uh, during these school hours and after the school hours. Thank you. Yeah. Before we move on, can I just a real quick thing? Um, am I correct? You're a national expert in school safety, right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> it's okay to say <laughs> yes. I mean, I just want to make people understand that you are part of that national organization for school safety and you're, I think you're on the board if you're not the president. Yes, I've, uh, I've been served 
certified, considered by Homeland Security and National to the Justice, U.S. Department of Justice as an expert in school safety. I, yeah. I am lucky enough to travel the country and work with districts and police departments on helping them with their districts. No, because I think sometimes familiar, familiar, familiarity um, breeds contempt. Like we, you're so close to us, and we know you went to we went to high school yep. together. And we, I, when I found that out, I was kind of surprised. I mean, you're usually a smart guy. I don't want to get the wrong idea. <laughs> no. <laughs> but when Chief Vass said, said um, I'm going to have Lieutenant Burke take over the team, and I said, well, why are you doing that? And he said, well, if you don't know this, Sean's a national expert in school safety. Um, so I think it's important to note that we're not just making it up as we go, that we're using national standards. Um, and and you, you're going to cross something to do that. The other thing I wanted to let you know, um, City Councilor from District A, Maria De La Cruz, has been on top of me to fill that fifth day. And so we found some money to do a fifth day here in this gym. And, um, and so we're trying to figure out when exactly to start because it was kind of crazy season a couple of weeks back. So we're, we're going to do so every night this in the city, there's going to be an open gym uh, for kids to go find uh, shelter and play and play ball or, or hang out. And I think people would be surprised that we don't take that time to do instruction or to do, you know, um, structured learning and stuff like that because kids just won't come. They just want a safe place to be to play ball or to hang out with their friends um, because either their block or their home is in a safe place for them. Um, and I think that's going to be a good addition to the work that you guys are already doing. Thank you very much. It, it is a great program. It, you'd be amazed at, at the relationships built and the, the attitude the kids have once, once they come in. Um, and Jamie, Jaime Adamas, Lawrence High School graduate. Yep. Uh, you're a high school graduate, Lawrence High School graduate. Um, I think Tommy might be a central kid. No. Uh, Tommy's Lawrence High. Lawrence High. The other kid's a central kid. Johnny, John Amano is a Lawrence kid, but he... He's a central he, kid. He graduated from a central. Let's be honest. And he, he graduated from another school. Yeah. He wasn't smart <laughs> enough to come to Lawrence High like I was. I'm not sure Tommy would appreciate being referred to as a central kid. Yeah. So. Uh, well, all right. <laughs> I like to be, I'd like to be called skinny, too. <laughs> um... Can I ask one, um, yeah, one question first? Is, um, and I, I, Lieutenant Burke? Yes, sir. Um, thank you. I, I, I really appreciate the overview on, and, and the approach, and, and, and it speaks to um, you know, real commitment to building good relationships with, with, with students and families. I, I am wondering, though, like, could you comment directly to um, uh, you know, the issue of gang activity within Lawrence High School. And that's what I would really like to understand um, tonight. Well, you, you, we have to realize that schools are just a microcosm of whatever the community is. We have to realize that Lawrence is an urban environment. We live in very close quarters and there is gang involvement. We're lucky enough that gang activity is not as bad as in other communities. So eventually, you are going to have gang members that, that come to all the schools. Being a gang member in itself is, is not a crime. Committing gang activity is a crime. And I'll tell you one thing, when I, when I mention that we don't like to make an arrest, we have great SROs and they know as soon as something is gang related, that is arrest. They're, that's when we do not usually exercise our option of, of non-arrest. I can tell you also from being here for 27 years, uh, there, there is not the outward gang activity that there used to be. Um, you know, we worked very hard with all the stakeholders from probation, from schools, uh, law enforcement, state, federal agencies, uh, and worked very hard to end that. Um, so, you know, obviously everyone has different experiences, but as far as outward gang activity, I think that is far, far less, uh, and we come across it far, far less than we used to. Uh, and today, <clears throat> this week, where what is the level of concern around gang activity at Lawrence High School as compared to last month, as compared to last year? Um, where where is it um, uh, right now? Well, I, I I think gangs is always a serious concern for this department. Uh, you can tell by the the resources that Chief Ask and the mayor have put in place. Um, we are lucky enough that, that we gather a lot of information and we have to realize that a lot of it doesn't happen in schools. We are a conduit of information, so when we receive that information, we pass it on to our gang unit, on to our detectives, 
and like, likewise, they pass it down to us. Um, so as far as outward gang activity, um, we're just not seeing that. We do have a high concern for it. We're always watching out. That is always one of our main concerns for any, especially an assault or anything violent, is, is this gang related? Why did it happen? Um, and that way we can address the root cause. Um, but as far as do I have a greater concern than I did last month, we've always had a great concern. And we, we've had that discussion recently that we are not going to allow it to go back to the way it was. And I can guarantee that. It will not. Does that mean there won't be isolated incidents that, that may be gang related? Of course. That doesn't mean that there are gangs ruling that school, that we see them uh, make an outward action because that would end immediately with the offices. Thank you, uh, Lieutenant. Appreciate that. Jess? Yeah, I think my question was going to be along those lines, but more general. And thank, thank you both for being here tonight, all three of you. Um, we heard a lot of concerns tonight that the level of violence, or not just not beyond even gang activity in the schools, is you know worse than it ever was, or is worse under receivership than it had been. And so I feel like you offer a unique perspective if you've been doing this for 27 years. Like it's it's been my impression. I've only lived in the city for 20 years, but things certainly seem a lot better these days than they do when I first moved here and better than stories that people used to tell me about the 70s and 80s for sure. Um, but I'm, I'm interested in your perspective, like have things gotten worse or if they have in some aspects but not in others, what are the ways they've gotten worse and what are the ways they've gotten better? You know, it, 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 it is, it's a hard question. It's, there are a lot of hard answers for it. So, I guess how I would phrase that to give you an, an answer that would answer that is that I think things are a lot better than they used to be. Um, does that mean they're perfect? No. And I understand that, that parents have concern because we have to realize that parents in this environment or any parent always goes with their personal experience with their child because everyone loves their children. Um, everyone wants to keep them safe. So it's personal experience. So. I'm not up here saying that none of these things ever happened. What I'm saying is overall, we are in a bit much, much better spot than we have been in the past. The other thing is that uh, I get a little protective when we start categorizing kids, especially if we take it in a lump sum of all Laurentians or, because we know, we know the perception, uh, the wrong perception that, that people have. And you have to realize that the vast, vast majority of the kids at Lawrence Public Schools are great, great kids. And, you know, I have so much respect for them from what you hear that they, you know, you go through just from living in an urban environment and having to go and trying to get an education. Um, so I would say that there are, there are very few gang members, there are very few kids that, that may need to, to leave to make it a better learning environment or may need to be arrested. They're, they are very, very minimal. Um, and believe me, they're they're on our radar, and you know we just can't go up and you know and and, and arrest them. But believe me, there is no there is no uh, option if they do something wrong. Thank you, John. Pat. Um, thank you for being here. Also, would you uh, help me understand this a little bit better? Would you please walk me through a hypothetical incident at the high school? What would, let's say, an active shooter, what happens at that point? And let's walk through the whole process. All right. Um, so if, if there was a call, and, and not keeping in mind any of the, the past symptoms, but this would, be, this would be hypothetical. If we, yes, hypothetical. And this would be, this is the view of the Lawrence Police Department, what we have trained for. So I would tell you that we have a, we have a policy and we have trained for a single officer response, which means for those of you who have seen things on the, on the news where the officer didn't go in or the officer waited for all the, the tank and the, the big guns to come, that's not our policy. So if, if there was a school that reported a, an active shooter, we would have a single officer response, meaning that either the SRO, if it was at the high school or if he was at another school, or the closest police officer would immediately go into that school, they would go to where the threat is, and they would end the threat. So. That is, that's an oversimplification of it, but 
through our training, we've also incorporated the idea that it's going to be a multi-jurisdictional response, which means anyone with a badge and a gun is going to be coming when they hear that on the radio. So we have prepared to train with other officers. It, it could be a postal inspector, it could be an Andover police officer, North Andover police officer. So immediately after that single officer goes in there, or however many officers first respond, we are immediately going to keep continue to send officers to where that threat is. With that happening, we are going to determine if people need help. And that was the, the training I mentioned with um, Lawrence General Hospital and the fire department. Once we have contained that, or we, uh, and even if it's not ended, even if it th there are things going on, we're going to determine where we can escort um, either the fire department or EMS into the school to help anyone that is injured and to remove them. Um, so that that is a response. and. Believe me, during those responses, you are continually going to get people, and whoever the commanding officer in there is going to deploy the resources on, on how we see fits, but the number one priority will be whatever officer is there will immediately go in and, and attempt to terminate the threat. All right, as a follow-up, how are the um, students and the staff at the high school notified that something is going on? The, uh, that would be a call for a lockdown, um, and that, that that is, the, that is the notification that everyone is to be in a locker room, lights are to be off, everyone would is that to be, be quiet. A, would that be a, an announcement over the PA system, or would it be a special code that would be announced? It would be an announcement um, in plain English over the uh, PA system. Codes are, are not recommended for the simple fact that if we have substitutes or anyone in that building, everyone knows what a lockdown is, get behind a locked door, but if you were to use code yellow, code red, that's, not everyone may know that. Okay. How many, are there practice drills at the high school periodically through the year? Yes, Mr. Finn does, does lockdown drills and, and every time that does happen, we have an, af, him and I uh, personally have an after action meeting, which means we go through it, we discuss what went right, what went wrong, and how to work, uh, to better it or to improve right, it the that, next time. That was my next question. Is there a, tight, a, a crisis team in place that could debrief after an incident to see what the response was, um, maybe debrief with the staff, or even the kids to see what their reaction was to the incident? They do have a crisis team, but the, the district may be better to, to speak to the process that they go through. How, long, how, how often are these practice drills occurring? So um, the, the fire drills happen about three times a year. Um, the lockdown drills happen twice a year. Um, it's, a, it's a very traumatic experience, so we try to minimize how many times we do that. Um, and the shelter in place, we try and do it twice a year. All right. Okay. Um, one, other, one other question. If the school is in lockdown, Communication into the school via the, the telephone lines. The staff in the office is still there answering phones. Is there any way the phones, when there is a lockdown, the phones could be diverted to central office so that all those calls could go to central office and people could respond from there rather than to have people in a lockdown situation having to respond on the phone? Well, I can tell you that there should be no one in that main office exactly. answering phones well, during a lockdown. Okay. Um, I, I don't know the, the technology limitations or the, the availability of transferring the phones during that, but we have to understand that this is an immediate response to a threat. So the, the, the main idea is during a lockdown or during any crisis situation, is to keep everything as simple as we can. We want, it, we want everyone to do the least amount of movement. We want the, every, all of these movements to be easy because we have to realize that our bodies are experiencing stress. We are going, our adrenaline is pumping. Even the idea of go, just simply locking a door becomes an arduous task because of your adrenaline, because of things that go through you. So that what we work with for lockdowns is that this is a crisis situation. Everyone has to do the bare minimum and that is just get behind the locked door. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I just have a, another question. 
If you guys, if we were to say to you, like, what is one or the top three things, like if, if money wasn't an issue, right? What are the investments that you would make to either, both to make the school more safe, because I understand what you're saying about things of where things are, and also that things can always get better, right? So what would you do to make the school more safe and to create an even deeper culture of safety at the schools? What, where would you invest resources, personnel, time, money, what, what have you? Well, um, depending on what categories we're looking at, obviously we, we think mental health is a, is a very big part of that, um, getting help to kids that need it. Um, so keeping that aside, and if we were looking at clearly an emergency response or a day-to-day -day safety issue as far as either personnel or physical changes, um, I think when, when we go out nationally, we look at a layered idea of safety, where layers, layers of safety should start at the, the campus, uh, the, the boundaries of the campus and moving in. I think every school should practice a single point secured entry lockdown where anyone who enters the school should not be able to move forward until they're screened. Uh, the doors should lock. Um, and if we're talking specifically in Lawrence, um, it, I, I know maybe selfishly or not, I would like to have more SROs. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Can I ask her that for, on behalf of the public schools? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I echo the mental health needs. So I would love to see more school adjustment counselors. Mm -hmm. The need that our students are coming in, and it's not only in Lawrence, but I'm specifically talking about Lawrence, um, Students are coming in with high needs of social emotional support, um, and we need school adjustment counselors to support that. So I would increase school adjustment counselors. I would increase school safety officers. Um, we currently have 10, and we could definitely use more. Um, I would also uh, would like for each school or academy to have um, BCBA, slash restorative justice specialists that work to de-escalate situations, mediate problems, and teach students how to resolve conflicts, and also um, help our, our educators learn some strategies to de-escalate situations and engage students better in the classroom. Thank you. I have just a quick couple of things. Um, The incident that happened that we talked about on the dating question, and um, did we actually find that there was an actual gun on the premises? No. No. When was the last time you think, I mean, you've been around, but the last time we actually found a gun on the premises at, at, at the high school? Uh, well, there was, a, there was a couple of years that I was in charge of at the administrative division, um, but I don't think there was a gun there. We, they're very, very rare. I, I, I don't know. Of, I would have to think back years before, if I've ever, um, since we found the gun. Yeah, I, the reason why I ask that question is because I, I wanna make sure that we're, when we're talking about incidences that seldom happen, and we are, I think, I think we're very prepared for that, man. I mean, I've seen the, 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 the active shooter trainings that you guys done, we did it over at the old Lucent site. Um, and for my part, um, I think that when we catch a kid who made a threat, um, and it becomes a threat that's not founded, which is all of them to date. That we have to work with that kid. It's, that kid is part of our community. Um, and so as an advocate to break down the school to prison pipeline, I, I, I think that that's part of what we have to figure out here. How come that kid is hurting so much? Or what silliness is going on in their life that they thought that would be funny? Um, and or so I, I, or and how can a school adjustment counselor work with that student so they don't get to that point? Yeah, um, and, and, call, and call that what that is and be clear about it, because I think that um, I remember getting that, having a conversation about that when we were having the, the gas crisis, the second one. You know, I, I made the superintendent come and talk to the press about it because, you know, people were just, they thought there was, you know, the, the things were going out of control. And the we reality- We actually had three crises that day. Yeah. Three different crises. On top of the gas one. Two additional on top of the gas yeah. one. Um, and so it is a complicated effort. And um, I think one of the things that I've learned from watching this, 
the, the school board before we went into receivership and we just say is that it used to be all the sky is falling. And when that happens, the, the professionals can't do what they have to do. And so I think that, um, you know, I try to create an environment where we work in City Hall that to let people know that sometimes there's a system that feels weird, but you gotta let it work because it makes everybody safe and, it, it, and it's as fair as you can be across the board. Um, and in situations like this, it does feel like, you know, people are like, hey, you know, they're not talking to the teachers, they're not talking to the parents, they're talking. And I just kept saying, it's gonna happen. They're dealing with the issue right now, give it a sec. These things have made us very impatient people. If I, you know, if I can get on Facebook, I should be able to get everything in the world for me. And so I, I just want to be, be, at least from my perspective, I know that Chief Vask has put the, the right people in place. Um, I worry a little bit about putting more men with guns in our schools. Um, I went to Lawrence High School, and you know, it was a tough place to go to school in this building. Um, but that place is a, is a palace of a campus. It's a palace. And kids have to feel that it's the place that they go to school and not a place that they go to jail. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think um, the mental health stuff, I think I would love to see that in the budget to see if we can bump that up. We are getting some more state money. Um, but there's always gonna be a people who would wanna make it seem like the sky is falling. And in those situations, you should not run to those people. You should run from those people. So towards people that are saying that things are good, we're gonna try to figure out how to make things better. And I, and I think I saw that that day and on at the gas crisis at the same time. Um, it, it's a very difficult thing to do, to keep, how many kids are in that building? 5,000, 4,700? 4,700. 3,200. Safe in and out every That's day. That's not including the staff in the building and the administrators. Yeah. That also had to be evacuated. And so yeah, I mean, I, I think we, you can always communicate better and making sure that you have the right cell phone numbers for the right parents, for all the parents. I know we try to keep doing that as well. Um, but this is in a situation where um, sec security is being ignored. Um, and uh, I mentioned the, the, I know it seems like it's just like a little thing to throw around that, they're, that the safety officers are from Lawrence High School. It's not a thing to throw around because Jaime Adamas and Caraballo and Lieutenant, they remember being those kids in those seats, so it's a, a real live experience for them. And uh, I think that they do their best to keep everybody safe. Um, but if, if we can you know, make sure that everyone knows that we do these things, I think it's, it's, it's good. But these things are so seldom. And you live in the society, so you know when something bad happens, try to keep it out of the, out of, out of the air. You know? And so I think, um, I'm glad we're having this discussion because I think it makes it better. Thanks. I mean, I want to echo the sentiment about looking at this in terms of the budget, though, because if I'm putting the numbers together correctly, if there are 15 counselors in the high school, and that's both guidance counselors and school adjustment counselors, and there's 3,200 kids, that's just on a you know straight division, that's over 200 children per counselor. That seems like something that really we need to beef up if we're going to be, you can't, adequately manage that kind of caseload and develop real relationships with kids, with, with all of the kids on your caseload and, and be attentive to everything that's going on. Yeah, and, the, and um, that's, so what we've done is partner with um, organizations. So we have six additional staff members from um, Gear Up. We have four additional staff members from Early College Program. So they help with, um, lightening the, the load for the counselors because they take on the students to do their college and career planning piece. Um, but, and then we also have uh, programs that come in and do mentoring. So they, so they get some social emotional supports through the mentoring programs with our community-based organizations. Uh, but it's still, we still have a need, a, a, a huge need, and that need is for our students to have access to social emotional supports on campus. The line or the wait time for students to get a therapist outside of the campus, it, we're talking three to six months. And that is a long time for a student, for any adolescent or any child. Why is the wait list that long? Because it could um, be because of insurance, it could be because of language, not enough social workers that speak Spanish. Um, and if they do, they um, have large caseloads, 
and um, many, uh, many young social workers um, serving our, our families, so they, their caseloads get, get also big. And then they spend three to five years in our community and then they move on to other things, so. But if I could move on with our communication piece from the, the high school. Um, just wanted to clarify, um, LPS practices has always been and continues to be to communicate with families first and directly, typically through a phone call um, to the number that families have provided. You'll hear from us and can be confident with the information. We urge all families to update their contact information with their schools. Many families have changed phone numbers. It's really important you go to your school and update that information so you have the most up-to-date information from the school department when a situation of safety arises at your child's school. Our communication during a crisis will be focused only on those things that impact safety, what's happening, what steps are being taken, and how these steps impact your child um, or you on that school day. When the issue is resolved, we will share the news immediately along with whatever details are appropriate. While it's natural to want um, more and detailed information, there are multiple considerations. For example, if there's an active law enforcement investigation, publicly sharing details can jeopardize its success. Number two, there are federal and state laws in place which restrict what any school district can share to protect student and family privacy. These are in place for good reasons and you can trust that if your child is ever involved in any way in a safety incident, we will take the responsibility of preserving their and your privacy very seriously. So our job is to balance two priorities. Number one, open communication. Number two, protecting the privacy and safety of individual students and families. The most important thing to know is that we will never withhold information that would make your child safer. So we shared on what families can do to help during these situations. Um, number one, don't self-deploy to the site. Many parents wanted to come directly to the safety of their child on campus, and that really delayed our dismissal, our controlled dismissal, because the buses could not come down the street to the high school. There was so much congestion and traffic. Um, number two, as hard as it is, try to avoid calling the school and contacting your child directly. Um, calling the school when we are on lockdown, everybody's on lockdown. So there is no staff manning the phone. That is a huge safety issue if there is potentially an active shooter or somebody out to harm another individual. We cannot put our clerks in that kind of dangerous situation. Um, the above are just examples looking um, for a list of whatever our best practices um, as we are learning, you know, what is it that we can work together to do to ensure that emergency situations are dealt in a way that's timely, informative to families, and helpful in securing the safety of all students and staff in the school building. Um, emergencies aren't only the time we want and need your help. If students or families see something that looks wrong or they know um, is a security issue, we want to know about it. On a campus this large with this many people, it absolutely has to be a community effort. See something, say something is very much in effect in how we will stay safe together. It, if it wasn't for the courage of two, young, two students who came directly to administration to show us the message, we wouldn't know about this situation potentially harming our students and our faculty. Um, if there's concerns about safety around campus, um, you know, going to a bathroom and there's potentially a fight, telling an administrator, a dean, a school culture specialist, hey, you may want to look at your bathroom on the second floor, um, doesn't necessarily put you in danger, but you at least advise, have told an adult that can do something about it. Not going to an arranged fight. Many students are arranging fights and 
um, naming a date, a time, and a location in the school building, and a number of students go to that location. What ends up happening is that there will be two individuals fighting, but then four or five other ones video recording it. So if you're the four or the five other ones video recording a situation, why aren't you the one sharing, if safety is a concern for you, why aren't you sharing that information with the adults that could do something about it? So if students want to keep themselves safe, I think um, keeping themselves in class, um, advising adults when um, they know that there's something unsafe happening in any part of the building, um, and any messages that are sent that are unsafe uh, or should be shared with the adults there so we can collaborate with Lawrence Police Department, collaborate with our school safety officers to ensure that no other children, no children or staff are harmed. We did share at the community forum the text a tip, which is um, just an anonymous tip line um, that you can text to, and law enforcement will look into the situation. Um, and we ask families to, and students to please use that text a tip. That would be really helpful. So there were some safety learnings, um, and we wanted to make sure that um, Every event is a learning opportunity. We're constantly revisiting practices to make sure things are working. Our goal is to share the most complete information possible in few messages as possible. We want you to know that if we're calling, it's important, but we also recognize that with cell phones on campus, information moves really fast, even or especially if it's inaccurate, as the mayor had shared. Um, moving forward, you'll receive a call immediately when a safety measure is in effect, either shelter in place or an evacuation or a lockdown. This is almost always a precaution and the message will make that clear. Updates will follow. In the case of a controlled dismissal that requires transportation for students, we will establish four area locations throughout the city to meet your for you to meet your child. Um, that was one that I, we felt was really important um, for families to at least be aware of where to get their child and um, deploy staff with the buses to ensure that um, a family member has uh, collected their child from those four um, area locations. We can't disclose those area locations um, because if we disclose those locations, then we're giving information to people that could potentially harm us if we send our students to another location. So those are the things that we have to pay attention to. It's not, one, it's not that we're trying to withhold information to keep parents guessing. It's more like we're, we're holding information to keep the person who's trying to harm an individual, um, we're trying to keep them guessing. So if you look at this slide, there's, a couple, there's lots of learnings. So we heard from families last week. We heard from staff. Um, uh, sued after the event, and we heard from students, and this is kind of a list of things moving forward that we heard that would be important. So the purchasing of chemical classroom toilets uh, for periods of times when we are, are in lockdown, um, those long periods of time. Um, increased training for in-house safety threats. Increased training to inform students during orientation and first days of school what to expect in the event of emergency, what is a shelter in place, and what is a lockdown, and also what their responsibility is in all three of those situations. Exploring text apps for staff notification during the event. Canned messages for immediate communication to families. Those have been developed in English and Spanish, so they're ready to go. A plan to support or calm more difficult classes or students. Um, Identifying, again, the four citywide transportation drop-offs in the event of an evacuation. Providing opportunities for teachers to appropriately prepare to support students. And finally, to continue to provide crisis counselors for students to process the event. Um, I, I, would always, I would also ask that those crisis counselors are available for staff. Um, we made sure to have calming places at the school uh, the week following the event for staff to be able to um, take a break and take care of themselves um, as they had to quickly adjust to um, providing 
lessons and teaching after a pretty jarring experience. So what's next for um, the high school? It's two categories, teaching and learning and school culture and climate. We're gonna ensure that all teachers are trained and supportive in restorative practices. Many teachers have already gone to the training. Um, teachers aren't all involved in a monthly uh, professional development on social emotional learning. We will continue those efforts. Um, we're cur aligning curriculum to build campus coherence. Coaching and supporting uh, support for teachers with zero to three years experience. So we can, we're giving them the supports that they need to be effective teachers and that will support them to um, stay working in Lawrence Public Schools as effective teachers and not have um, a, tur a turnover rate um, at 26%. We're looking to lower that. A campus-wide school leadership team meeting is scheduled for December 3rd, and that school leadership team is compromised of students, family, a student, a parent, a teacher, and an administrator of every school, um, every academy at the high school. And their school culture and climate, we're going to continue to meet with students, staff, and families regularly, survey students, staff, and families, um, small group discussions with students, staff, and families, collaborate with community-based youth advocates, um, and ignite and support students, staff, and families for leadership and voice. Any uh, additional questions? Pat? Um, Marisol, I'm, I'm really impressed with the next steps and the slide before. Um, it just appears to me that you've listened to what the parents their concerns and the staff and the kids, and you've worked up strategies um, to address those. What I was wondering is um, probably near the end of the year, sometime in the spring, if you could come back and let us know how the climate is at the high school after all this has been implemented, I think that would be a big help for us. Yeah, um, I would also like to show survey responses from this period and then the springtime to see what, if we had any growth in helping the community Perfect. to feel safe for That's teaching great. and learning. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I, I would just emphasize that I think the ongoing work of building relationships with families is really important in this. And just to give you a small example, like if you have a situation where you've sent out a communication to families because you know, something crazy is going down at the high school. I mean, we have so many families from different countries of origin here. And if your life experience is coming from a country of origin where a situation like that would escalate out of control or there's a history of civil violence and civil strife, if you don't have a relationship, a trusted relationship with a teacher or somebody at the school, you're not going to pay any attention to a sort of like memo that went home that said that says please don't come to the school in this situation you're gonna haul ass down to that school and be there for your kid excuse my French and so I just think that that work of of building that relationship on a continual basis is something that we need to invest in as a system absolutely Thank you um, all. Greatly appreciate you um, taking the time tonight to, um, to update us and, and share with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm moving to uh, report of the chair um, on turnaround plan update uh, I distributed to uh, members of the turnaround subcommittee um, three um, finalists uh, for a DESI bid for community facilitators. I sent this yesterday, and this is something that I just asked you to look at, not email? on a deadline of today, email. Yeah. Okay, I haven't. Did you get it? I got it. Okay. I don't, I'll have to, um, I don't think I got yeah, it. Yeah, and just need you to... Um, look at that and um, 
uh, if you can look at it by the end of the week, and if you have concerns uh, uh, or questions, talk to the superintendent okay. on that. And can I just share? Yep. I had a conversation with someone at DESE yesterday about the process. And so in addition to us having you know, substantial input on who that facilitator is, who helps out, we're going to have a meeting of the turnaround subcommittee so that we can kind of have our plan around um, engaging, like working with that facilitator to design the community process for input into the into the turnaround plan going forward. Um, and I just want to say, I know that most of the parents have gone home, but I feel that some of these questions around the length of receivership and the transition plan are questions that we ourselves on this board have as well. Um, and so I'm hoping that the turnaround plan process will help clarify that somewhat, but I think we're gonna also be more proactive about figuring out with the state what the deal is around that. Yep, and um, I, I, those are points well taken. Um, uh, on earned autonomy um, framework, we are in the process of trying to engage a, um, uh, a consultant there who would help mostly with um, the number crunching um, that needs to be done when you're going to have a framework uh, that essentially um, uh, serves like a calculator for schools. Um, uh, relative to the weight of like any factors you arrive at, whether it's like to what degree do you want to weigh family engagement as a factor. It's not specific to test scores, but how are you gonna calculate what you come up with as a community uh, are, are the priorities and the importance. Um, and then what are the underlying measurements on that? Um, I think the hope is to have facilitator on the turnaround side, consultant on the earned autonomy side in place before the December meeting um, to establish the steering committee uh, for earned autonomy by the December meeting, um, which will be made up of community stakeholders. That turnaround will meet between now and the December meeting to begin to shape what the uh, community engagement process um, will look like so that in December we will have a map sort of to the end of the year uh, of the process and how the two processes will run hopefully um, in sync. Make sense? Okay. Um, on student representative, I would direct Pat and Jess and Julia is not here, but you have in your binder um, potential candidates to review. And you can um, decide from there uh, how you want to proceed um, in, um, in reaching a um, a decision or a recommendation on that as a subcommittee. And that can, you know, um, you can really shape that process as you see fit. Um, no, this is student representative. Yeah. Oh, um, sorry. <laughs> all right, so that covers really those, those three um, areas. I do want to turn it back over to the superintendent for a, an update. So th I, I was supposed to share this with you all. Are you leaving? No. Yeah. Okay, good. I think they'll leave now. Um, I, I just wanted to share our good news with the high school. So we got news that the high school has been reaccredited. Come on. Yeah. You just get yeah. that? Yeah, so that's really exciting. Are you sure? And all credit goes to our high school staff, teachers who have worked tirelessly for this, our administrators, the committee. We're going to be, Chris Markins, who's in the room, is going to be writing a press release and we're going to be having proper celebrations and learnings from this, but this is a really, really exciting time for us as a district and in particular for our high school. Great. Congratulations. Great. 
I'm um, going to just move on to our uh, final matters. Um, uh, Chair would accept a uh, motion to approve the minutes of the executive session held on August 14th, 2019. So moved. So I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Um, the motion carries. Uh, Chair would accept a motion uh, to approve the minutes of the regular meeting held on August 14th, 2019. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Uh, Chair would accept a motion to approve the minutes of the regular meeting held on September 11th, 2019. So moved. Second. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Chair would accept a motion to approve the minutes of the regular session held on October 9th, 2019. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? The motion carries. Are there any um, final matters, remarks, or comments any um, board members wish to make? Mr. Just, Mayor. Just to, I know that um, since Superintendent Toomey was looking for a, a person to sit on the, um, from the LAE board to sit on the, um, the special needs, what? C cabinet. And I'd like to um, volunteer. Um, and, um, this is kind of like a little thing, but it's, I think, can we just make sure we vote on the minutes every meeting? Like, it feels like an easy thing enough to do. Um, and everybody hates me because I bring this up. But it feels like going back in history and doing minutes, it just feels like a clumsy thing. Um, um, yeah, that's, that, that, that's the intent. And this was uh, my fault. I held them on, uh, on to the matters because I just, we, we had some technical language that we need to make sure we got right. All right. All right um, I, but it's a point well taken. Thank you. Um, any other comments, remarks? All right, uh, at this time, uh, Chair would accept a uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? At uh, this time, we are uh, adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>